In 1839, the dream of having a cable that stretched across the Atlantic Ocean was just one of a few engineers after the birth of the telegraph. In 1858, less than two decades later, the first message was sent across the Atlantic by telegraph cable, reading, Glory to God in the highest, on earth, peace and goodwill towards men. So. How did an idea as world-changing as linking Europe to the Americas go from dream to reality in under two decades? Let's take a look. After the invention of the telegraph by William Cook and Charles Wheatstone, Samuel Morse believed that the concept of a transatlantic communications network was one of possibility. Experts continued to debate the idea until, in 1850, a line was laid between Great Britain and France, the longest of the time. Later on, in 1850, construction began on a line heading from the northeast coast of America to Nova Scotia to Newfoundland. This northeastern cable was set to be the largest communication cable yet, and its construction was led by a man named Frederick Newton Gisborne. This cable was eventually completed, though Gisborne's company collapsed in 1853 as the line didn't prove profitable. However, after that quick failure, Gisborne met a businessman named Cyrus Westfield. He believed in Gisborne's idea of extending the existing cable network across the Atlantic, and he had the funds to make it happen. Samuel Morse served as the technical liaison, and an oceanographer was consulted as well. After initial planning, Gisborne and Field founded the New York, Newfoundland, and London Telegraph Company. Field funded this venture with help from the US and UK governments, as well as selling stock and funding a large portion with his own funds. It finally took shape in 1857 when the first attempt was made to lay the transatlantic cable. Manufactured by Glass Elliott & Co. and R.S. Newall & Co., the copper inner cable was covered in latex, which engineers believed to be enough to protect it from marine life. It was then covered in wound, tarred hemp, supported further by a sheath of iron wiring. This made the cable relatively flexible while also being incredibly strong. The HMS Agamemnon and the USS Niagara were used to tow the cable. Setting off on their cable-laying journey from Southern Ireland on August 5th, one of the operations started off with a bang or rather a snap as the cable broke and it had to be retrieved off the bottom of the sea floor. After that, the cable broke again but this time, it was too deep, so the operation was shuttered until the next year. Following the two cable snaps, plans were rearranged, and the two ships were set to ship off from one continent each, meeting in the middle to connect the cables and then head back to their respective ports, pulling their portion of the cables back. The cable unfortunately broke again after just 6 kilometers, and then again after 100 kilometers and then again after 370 kilometers. Things weren't looking good. Crews were up for a third try, and they set out on July 29, 1858. Despite navigational errors, thanks to the electrical charge of the cable, the ships successfully navigated to their respective ports on the 4th and 5th of August. The USS Niagara docking in Trinity Bay in Newfoundland, and the Agamemnon docking in Valentia Island on the western coast of Ireland. Utilizing horses, crews then positioned the shore sides of the cable to the correct places and they were connected together. On August 16th, the first message was sent, followed by a message from Queen Victoria to the US President James Buchanan at the time. The Queen and the President sent two rather wordy messages, which weren't exactly designed for this transatlantic communication technique. Reception over the cable was terrible, and each character took two minutes to transmit. The first message took just shy of 18 hours, far from modern-day instant messaging. The cable's initial success didn't last long, though. On the 3rd of September, the cable failed. This was due to engineers boosting the voltage on the line from 600 to 2,000 volts in hopes of speeding up transmission, and it fried somewhere along the great distance. It was a short life for the first cable. It wasn't until 1854 that the next cable was laid. These first cables were cored with copper, but now our modern transatlantic cables are all fiber optic, the first having been laid in 1988. In contrast, the first cables could transmit words every few minutes on a good day. Modern cables can transmit the equivalent of 84 billion words per minute. 
Digging into fiber optic cable engineering further, we can see why these speeds are so much greater than metal cables. Your standard fiber optic cable has one or many optical fibers that are coated by flexible plastic layers, all encapsulated in a protective jacket. When these cables need to be laid on the sea floor, they'll be functionally the same with much more outer protection. In essence, you're left with this layout. The fiber optic cable on the inside, surrounded by petroleum jelly, surrounded by a copper or aluminum tubing, then by polycarbonate, then by aluminum water barriers, then by steel wires, then by mylar tape, and finally, your outer layer for marine cables is usually a polyethylene protective jacket. This layout provides for optimum protection for fiber optic cables, but how do they work? Submarine cables, or underwater cables, transmit data through flashes of light through the fiber optic cable, the speed limiter for data transfer then being the speed of light. At regular intervals, there will be optically amplified repeaters to boost the signal. Transatlantic cables continue to be the foundation of facilitating global trade in communication. This core technology that started off on a rocky road of failures is now a successful highway of information for people across the globe.